Okay. Um, <clears throat> my name is Eunsu Kang. I'm going to talk about creative AI and machine surrogacy at the intersection of art and machine learning. And the title is too big, but I need to be responsible, so I try to put all of them in my slides. So I'm going to talk really fast and skip some slides, just finish it in 15 minutes. So I'm an artist and a researcher and an educator. Um, I was an art professor, then most recently I was teaching art and machine learning and creative AI at the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University, and I'm a mom, obviously. And these are a little bit of a list of things I've done, like unknown creature imagined by AI, and machinic surrogate research, fake news generation, sculpture object generation, opera generation, and um, discussions such as the rise of minority and creativity in AI. So where are we now? We are living at the era of AI art. It's mind-blowing and also controversial. In 2017 June, the generated art images by Creative Adversarial Networks, it's called CAN, were favored by human viewers over the images of paintings at the prestigious Miami Art Basel. Well, the comparison method, there is, it's arguable, but the result shows that uh, people, when they looked at the thumbnail of uh, paintings at the Miami Art Basel and generated images from this algorithm, they preferred um, in terms of creativity, inspirational, and all these um, um, characteristics, they preferred these generated results. In 2018 May, Cloud Painter, uh, top prize winner of the robot art competition in 2018 proved that a machine can achieve the aesthetic level of professional painters. There are many other robot painters now successfully creating painters. If we um, compare just the result without knowing it's a robot painter, you may think it's by a, a human, professional human painter. In 2018 October, this was this image was printed the image was sold um, for almost half a million dollars at the Christie auction. This will come back at the, as the last slide again, so we'll talk more. And since then, it's everywhere, art including sense, li dance, literature, music, poetry, and sculpture. There are lots of examples of artworks using machine learning at this point, but this um, to make it brief, I'm going to talk about those works I made with my teammates at the intersection of art and machine learning. First, the sculpture generation. So we try to um, generate sculpture, but to be, a, to be an authentic sculpture, we don't want to mimic existing artworks. So we had point cloud data set that has ordinary objects such as airplane, tables, chairs, um, bottles, toilets, etc., human shapes. Then, it's what, when it was trained to be able to generate such shapes, we tweaked the algorithm. So the algorithm tried to make something that's not any of them. And we wanted to see if we can find a meaningful aesthetical result when we ask that to the algorithm. And that's um, what you see is one of those results. To do that, obviously, we had to develop our own algorithms. And one of them is called Amalgamated Deep Dream. It has the name Deep Dream because um, the method we are using is inspired by two-dimensional image Deep Dream method. It's completely different algorithm mathematically, but the inspiration comes from the 2D Deep Dream, which uses um, amplifying a feature iteratively through the layers of neural network. So we did a similar thing with point clouds, but when we tried naive deep dream, the result became a, just a um, scarce point in the space instead of creating a form. So we decided to add little other features such as amalgamating um, objects together to create a more dense and complex starting point. Also, we tried to partition the deep dream. This is sister algorithm of ADD and partitioning the each object and deep dreaming those partitions and bring, that, bring them back together. These are one of those results when we tried our new um, algorithms. And then um, we had to uh, reconstruct the point clouds into mesh, mostly using both pivoting, but we tried many other things, and then print it. 
um, into actual object that we can hold. And there are many some other methods we've developed, but uh, I'm going to skip this. I'm going to skip this too. Um, and skip this. So, um, the printed objects became a part of a project called Oral Fauna. Um, you can see the list of names that many people contributed to this project. It's an interaction with unknown creature imagined by AI. Oral fauna forms the body is generated by ADD and PDD. Also, we are using an um, algorithm called WaveGAN to generate their voices. And the data set uh, for the voice was a collection of um, bird sound, um, insect sound, machine sound, Pokemon sound, and etc. And that uh, oral fauna responds to people, to the visitors, um, visitors sound and touch. When the visitor um, draws um, lines on the iPad interface, that we consider that they are remotely touching the oral fauna, and you can also talk to them through a microphone. Are you oral fauna? those um, algorithms that we've developed. But can AI be really creative? That's a big question. So my colleague, and, and also how do we make an algorithm more creative? So my colleague, um, Professor O and I um, actually made a new curriculum and had a class called Creative AI at the Carnegie Mellon University with graduate students. And we studied it over the uh, last semester. And at the first thing we did was bringing a philosophy professor and discussing what is creativity. How do we define it? Um, of course, that's a, such a big question. But uh, w what we asked is that students should figure out a little very narrow down definition of creativity they are going to use for their specific project. So all of them can have different um, definition. Then they should use it um, to develop and analyze. Uh, evaluate their work. Usually, if you look at um, modeling creativity, um, then this is kind of consensus. Novel as well as high quality in the domain. It's still subjective. This is uh, pretty much the agreement most people can get to. 
And of course, there are lots of um, different uh, definitions of creativity you can study, like Bowden's creativity definitions, and even going back all the way back to Newell and Simons. And after studying and developing um, different algorithms, we got to this qu these questions, can we computationally model ambiguity? Ambiguity is an important concept um, because, for example, when we developed ADD and PDD, how we find that space not mimicking exactly what was done before, but somewhere in between to add a little bit of creativity. And the ambiguity um, between those uh, generated results, that's what we need to be able to implement in our algorithm. And with the novelty search, novelty search is, uh, in other words, non-objective search. So more like uh, randomly searching, exploring around and getting some results. Um, there are some research results saying novelty, um, novelty search um, brings pretty good results, interesting results. And novelty is always what we are looking for to create um, creative result. Then there is another question coming up that it can result in valuable discovery. Is it going to be, which is related to the third question, is, is it going to be just a random result or a creative result? And the last but not least, how do we evaluate the creativity of an algorithm? To say that when human being is creative, people have human-centered um, subjective opinions about it, but when it's algorithm, when it's AI, people will ask, how do you know it's creative? And we need an answer, and we need to be able to analyze and evaluate the result, but we don't really have um, evaluation metrics existing at this point. So we worked on that a little bit as well. Uh, moving on, um, if you are interested in all the things that I can give you the class syllabus website and it has more details. Um, there are two things I always tell students to think about the future of creative AI. One is the universe generation research. These researchers, machine learning researchers and cosmologists, they were successfully um, simulating the universe by using the data set collected by cosmologists. But then what they couldn't do so far is this, generating rare galaxies or other interesting objects or events in the universe. Because when you are trying to um, simulate it, the, um, it's, uh, it's, it's learning from the center um, of the distribution. But at the tail of distribution, those rare events exist, but they cannot be learned easily. Then how can we learn those very rare event at the tail of distribution. I believe if researchers figure that out, we can directly apply that to a creativity because that might be where we can find creativity for the algorithm. The other example is uh, Go field. AI Go for programs have changed the world of Go by suggesting novel strategies and by providing abundant amount of practices. So the level of, the average level of Go, average skill set of Go field, uh, people in Go field, that's actually has improved in, in last four or five years. Um, and also, people who are not masters even, started use little interesting strategies they learned from programs, not from um, people's um, books, old master's books. So that, in my opinion, it shows that even, even with art, we might be able to find different perspective of looking at creativity and bring, being creative. However, um, Isedo, the person who won against the AlphaGo once, and he just retired because um, he said, because he knows that he cannot win against um, AI Go programs, there is no meaning of uh, staying in the field. And he also said, um, for him, Go is a conversation between human and human. And now we are um, playing against computers and I lost that conversation. Then can we bring that conversation back with machines and with the assistant of machines? That would be related to this question 
if we can collaborate, if they can be a collaborator. Um, collaboration, the definition in art, so my student and I studied it last year, and it's a profound mutual effort that creates a third artistic identity superimposed over an exceeding the individual artists. So it's not just one and one together, it should emerge the third identity, that's the real collaboration, as far as we studied. In this sense, um, what happens, and then we studied what um, all the machine learning artwork currently existing, our conclusion is that what's happening is machinic surrogacy. So, um, proxies for skills and decisions and biases of human agents, and humans are working as inspirers, and the machinic surrogacy in the algorithm or in the machine that's creating those artwork or a result. From this point of view, we examined human-machine relationships in computational creativity using these three assumptions. This is the diagram. So there are people creating, um, developing algorithms, then author, and we can be author and user, and people are using it, and evaluating as moderator, and become, uh, become the audience. This is just a spectrum. So even in one project and one person can be the author and audience, user and moderator, and there are many different combinations. But this is in general the understanding. Many machine learning art artists at this point are staying between um, author, user, user, moderator. The last slide. So in terms of that, if you look back, at that controversial example of this painting that was sold for almost half a million. This, uh, the team, the obvious, who sold it at the Christie auction, um, they were not the creators of the algorithm, not the creators of um, the implementation either. So that Ian Goodfellow and his team created generative adversarial networks, as, um, as everyone knows. And then um, Sumith Chitala's uh, implemented it as this again, and Robbie Barrett um, modified this again and created art this again for using painting as data set. And then the obvious used Robbie Barrett's implementation, downloading it from the GitHub, and fed um, different set of paintings and got the result. And Christie decided to sell it as um, the first ever AI generated painting, which is not true. Um, and then that was sold and exposed um, through the media widely. So in this case, how do we define the authorship and ownership of this artwork? Obviously, the AI doesn't have a bank account, and it went somewhere. So that leaves us a big question that we should explore altogether. Okay, that's it. <laughs>